All right, so we're gonna do a little different type of show today. This is gonna be a kind of like behind the scenes look, but we do a lot of reef fishing here. It's probably the most popular kind of fishing to do. So the reef fishing is really important to us, but one thing that we had never really showed is how all these reefs get there. Some of them are naturally occurring reefs that are you know, already there, but a lot of these reefs we put out there for the fish to live on so that we can go catch them. Jason the Sun is brought to you by Holiday Inn Resort, Panama City Beach. Hummingbird, simply, clearly better. Dulce Vida Tequila. Smith Optics. And by Pirates Cove Marina. You enjoy the golf, we'll take care of the rest. We do all these different kinds of fishing. We got the beach stuff, the inshore redfish, and all that stuff. And y'all seen us do that. But we do a lot of reef fishing here. It's probably the most popular kind of fishing to do. That's where we catch our red snappers and groupers and kingfish and amberjacks and all those species. So the reef fishing is really important to us. I, I think that was my fish. All right, so we're gonna catch the snapper slam today. We got the mangrove. Here's your red. How will these reefs get there? Some of them are naturally occurring reefs that are you know already there. But a lot of these reefs we put out there for the fish to live on so that we can go catch them. So behind me are reels that we're repurposing for use as artificial reefs. These were donated from ocean engineering from some of the industrial operations that they have here where they weave different types of communication cables and also various pieces of pipeline together to service the oil and gas industry. Man, these spools are massive. I mean, they're 35 feet tall. Now, when you're talking about building artificial reefs, you have to have specialized equipment, and there's probably only a few places that can do this. So initially, the project was started March of 2021, when we received information that uh, Oceaneering had some reels that they were interested in uh, providing to the artificial reef program and the Bay County Board of County Commissioners. One of the neat things about these artificial reef deployments is it's basically just a big experiment. Artificial reefs are monumental and I wanted to be a part of, of this project in whatever capacity that I could. So working with the Bay County Extension, I can take it from a scientific perspective and look at these fish populations to see what's lacking and then we have the opportunity to put the reef structures in place to kind of bring this bridge together with the mesopelagic fish that are moving from the sea grasses. We'll have this nice middle ground right before they go off into being the deep sea species that they are. I've watched these deployments go out for decades and every time they do it, they're putting a lot of the similar structures in different areas. Now they can take the exact same type of structure and put it half a mile away on the same type of bottom and all of a sudden that has more amberjacks or grouper on it. And so it, it's really a big experiment and they put these structures out there, we know what they are, but you have to get out there and fish them to realize what each type of structure is gonna hold. The Gulf of Mexico and Northwest Florida in general is unconsolidated sand interrupted with little patches of limestone that hold typically lots of fish. It's exciting that we are able to complement those natural areas with projects like this, with hard substrate that mimics some of the harder coils that we might be more familiar with in South Florida. We can put those types of structures here in Northwest Florida to support our fishing and diving community and the recreational users that come to visit us. So we put a lot of different types of structure out in the Gulf for these fish to live on. It's what we call artificial reefs. So the artificial reef materials that we're looking for are stable and durable and have a life expectancy of greater than 50 years. Those would be the perfect materials. Some of those are concrete, which are engineered specifically for artificial reefs. Sometimes they come to us as secondary uh, materials, which could mean uh, boats or vessels that we see, large ships, retired military aircraft as an example of secondary use materials. 
it's a very highly regulated system to put these reefs out here. So you can't just go sink stuff on your own and there's only certain approved materials you can use. It's not easy just to show up one day and roll the reels off into the water and expect that they will land upright. A lot of work goes into preparation before we even get to the point of deployment day. One of the things we had to work out is how we were going to deploy the reefs. And so this required a little bit of research and some information that we had pointed to historical deployments where they had used barges in the past and set up a two rail system. The two rail system is important because it makes sure that the reels roll true off of the end of the barge and then sit straight up and down. So to do that, we had to work to get the proper metal and then weld it to the barge. We rely on large cranes that were provided to us by the Port of Panama City and their crews and their expertise to work together with the marine contractor to get the reels upon the barge in the proper way. Now, if you wonder like why we're trying to set them vertically on the barge, is because we want them to sink vertically and land on the bottom vertically because we want that relief off the bottom. That's what attracts a lot of these fish. We've got three reels that are in the neighborhood of about 30 feet in diameter and weigh close to 50 tons. The largest reel that we have is about 35 feet tall. It weighs nearly 60 tons. All of the reels that we have, five total, are gonna to be sunk in two different locations, about 11 nautical miles southwest of St. Andrew Bay Pass. We're blessed in Bay County to have a variety of marine contractors that can help us with a project that's this complex. I've learned so much since we started doing this show about how these artificial reefs work, not just deployment and stuff like that, but the areas they put them in and then, you know, how fish take to them. All right, so we just ran out to an artificial reef, not too far out, you still see all the condos right here. I've had a great opportunity to get to talk with people like these biologists with the Fish and Wildlife here locally, but then I also get to talk with people like Dr. Guy Harvey, who is probably more knowledgeable about building reefs and how the, the marine ecosystem works than anybody I know for sure. All right, I'm back with Dr. Guy Harvey here, and I don't know if y'all remember, a few years ago on Chasing the Sun TV, we interviewed him talking about some artificial reefs. Well, today we're gonna to talk about more artificial reefs because our population keeps growing in Panama City Beach. We have more people on the water fishing every year. So the way that I think we keep up with that is building more reefs, right? How are the reefs you defined six years ago, how have they performed? The next year we were fishing on this and we were catching fish. That's amazing. And of course the recruitment process on artificial reefs is what we're after. A for you know the, the entertainment and the, the fishing value, but also from a, a scientific and biological value, the accumulation of new life that a, an artificial reef causes is measurable. And that's why it's so important to say, how well did this reef do over that period, the, the six year period? What do you expect it to do over the next six years? And when do you need to replace them? Because they do have a, a limited life eventually. Yeah. yeah. So what, what are you using now, Justin, for your artificial reefs? Our local government, has teamed up with uh, like oceaneering, which yeah. builds these giant metal spools. Yeah. So in, in 100 feet of water, that yeah. thing's gonna be 30 feet off the bottom. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, that, that's good uh, structure for a lot of different species of fish. Yeah. And of course, you want sessile animals to settle all over your artificial reef, little barnacles, soft corals, hard corals, um, and to grow the biomass generally provides shelter for baby fish, bigger fish, and the predatory fish that we like to catch. Uh, and multiply that formula over a wide area. His life mission is making the oceans of the world a better place, not just for fish, but for us to be able to, to enjoy as well. You know, this is dangerous, unforgiving work these guys are doing at the port, and I just wanna give them a shout out because they work around the clock to keep this city running, to keep ships coming in, going out, getting loaded, unloaded safely, it lets us live the way of life that we do. Not every community has all of the resources that we have in Panama City. We 
we have a group of folks that routinely, this is their job every day, is to unload cargo and move large items off of ships arriving daily at our port. This crew was vital in helping us with this project. The skill that it takes to safely maneuver from the shoreline out to the deployment area and requires a lot of knowledge and skill to adapt to those conditions that are ever changing. On the day that we deployed the largest reel, which is 35 feet tall and weighs over 60 tons, that was the only reel that we took out because of the stability and the things that are required to move that size of a reel uh, to the deployment site. Uh, there is actually some ballast water that was placed in the aft portion of the barge so that it rolled off easily with just a gentle slope and a slow amount of roll. And what I like to say was a, a slow roll and a big splash. It'll you know, draw more tourism to us, but it's also going to provide a basis for education for those that weren't aware that we have such a, a large you know, reef structure going from Escambia all the way down to Gulf. It's going to give tourists more opportunities to get out in the water, to ask questions and learn about why the fish populations are so viable here and maybe even get them involved. We might have folks that'll come into the state for vacation and it could lead to them staying to become a greater part of the community that we're trying to establish now. It takes about three to five years for the reef to reach its full capacity. Initially, we'll see bait fish and transient species like barracuda come through and show up. Within a few months, then we'll start to see some of the prized reef fish like grouper and snapper show up and call the reef home. Following that, we can expect uh, tourists and divers and fishermen to show up for decades to come. So now that these pools are on the bottom, I bet they're already covered up with bait fish and I can't wait to get out there soon and see what kind of fish are already taking up residence on the latest artificial reefs. I have to say this isn't something I thought would happen this year, would be filming one of our shows on a headboat. I definitely didn't think we'd be going out a second time on the headboat. Well, here we are heading out again, and the reason is because the tourism folks did a survey and all these snowbirds that were coming down from the north, from Canada, said, while you're here, what do you want to do? And that's when we turned to the head boat is because we're looking for 70 plus people per boat to get on board and go fishing. So it was a cool opportunity for us to jump on the boat with them and get to go out there for the first trip of the season. These head boats have not run yet, and they typically don't run in February, but now because there's so many people here wanting to fish in February, they're starting to operate. So this was their first trip of the year, and lucky for us, we get to jump on with them. But this is the first time in the history of our show where we've actually got to get on the boat with so many people and share it with everybody in real life. So I'm appreciative that y'all are interested in it and that y'all wanted to do it. You're here at the beach, the weather's pretty. I mean, who wouldn't want to go fishing right now? This is uncharted territory for everybody because these captains are, are typically going to start operating in early March and the water's warmed up again and you know just everything's different. So starting a month earlier, uh, it puts them you know kind of in a position where they're going to do some looking around. They hadn't fished these reefs in months and you know they can't exactly pick up right where they left off because when they left off the water was a lot warmer, there's a lot of bait inshore and everything's completely different. So I knew this was going to be a little bit of a, a little bit of hunting around to find the best bite. Um, but I tell you what, they did a great job. It didn't take them long. After we made a couple of stops, I think they started to figure out real quick what we were going to have to do to get some bites and catch some fish. First fish, you got to give him a kiss. All right. <laughs> That's another Almaco. How about that? Yeah, keep him over the boat. You can keep him. 
that's one of the best eating guys out here. If you're looking for a cost-effective way to get on the water, I don't know that there's a better way to do it, okay? I mean, you now you're gonna be fishing with a big crowd, so you're gonna have to be patient. But you can get on these head boats, and every head boat has their own set of rules. Most of them use a number system. When you buy a ticket, you get a number. There's a spot on that, it's on the side of the boat with your number on it, and that's your spot to fish. So there's a number on either side of you, and you're gonna have somebody there too. So what we're trying to do is fish vertically. And the reason we want to fish vertically is because if your line goes one way or the other, now you're tangled. And that's also the reason you may look at this footage and go, you know, man, where are all these giant fish that we sometimes see y'all catching? Well, if you're on a head boat and you hook something really big and that fish runs around, now you're tangled around everybody else. So this is, like I said, this is a cost-effective way to get on the water and actually experience fishing in the Gulf and catch fish. But in doing that, you're not gonna be targeting the biggest fish that grow out here, okay? We're gonna try to stick with a smaller size class of fish and that way when you hook that fish, you can bring it straight up to the surface. And that way everybody doesn't get tangled and everybody gets to catch the fish. Beautiful fish, we'll be seeing them here in a couple months. We're gonna let him go, let him grow. So a lot of times on these head boats, they're trying to find some of that natural bottom that's gonna have fish on it, but you're not gonna get hung up all the time. The one cool thing about this trip is the first couple areas of natural bottom weren't producing really good. So the captain had a great plan. He said, look, we're gonna fish some of these wrecks, just like these artificial reefs that we put out here, okay? He wanted to fish some of those, but instead of dropping all the way down to the bottom, he had everybody fishing kind of mid water column. And it was amazing how good it worked. Chasing the Sun has been brought to you by Minn Kota. Florida Water Sports. Grundens, we are fishing. Panama City Inshore, these guys can fish. And by Visit Panama City Beach, real fun beach. So on my typical charter, I usually carry two or three people at a time, okay? That's two or three lines to worry about. And we still get tangled sometimes. And watching these deckhands on these head boats manage 15 to 20 lines at a time and watching these people constantly getting tangled. It honestly makes my head hurt just thinking of how they can keep up. Another vermilion snapper. We're gonna make sure he's 10 inches, that way we can see if we can keep him. He is over 10 inches. He's almost 11 inches. So that there is a keeper vermilion snapper. Not the biggest one, but he'll definitely make a dang sure nice fish taco. Okay, if you're starting to wonder why the women catch more fish than men on a trip like this, it's because men don't listen to instructions very well. And I can say that because that's me too, right? And I'm being serious, okay? So this captain and crew wants one thing, and it's for you to catch fish. Safety, fun, all that too. But they want you to catch fish. So they're trying to teach you how to catch fish. When the captain says, don't drop down until he hits the horn, what do you do? Every guy out there is trying to cheat it a little bit and start dropping down before he hits the horn. Well, you know what happens? The boat's still moving, so now everybody gets tangled. All right, guys, make sure you're reeling it up off the bottom. Don't let it sit down there on the bottom. If you do, you're going to get hung. You're connected in with somebody on the horn. Hey, guys, if you're tightening up over there, give me some slack. The deckhands, they're trying to give instruction, OK? I get it. These people are from up north. A lot of people grow up fishing lakes with a J hook. And what do you do when you get a bite? You gotta set the hook, right? Okay, well that doesn't work here in the Gulf of Mexico because we're fishing circle hooks. If you set the hook, you'll miss that bite. So, got another vermilion snapper. Keep her size. We'll be going home for dinner. My favorite thing about what I do for a living is getting to carry people out there and see them have a first experience. Who knows what the number was of the biggest thing? Six and seven. 
Number six and number seven. It was six and seven. Right there. But this was a little different. Watching these snowbirds come down, and for a lot of them, it was the first time getting on a boat actually getting on the water in the Gulf of Mexico. So for me, that was fun just talking and sharing those experiences with them. And then a lot of them, it was the first saltwater fish they've ever caught. So it doesn't matter your age. Some of these folks were older and they just hadn't got to experience this. So if you're a man over 80, keep your hand up. Are there any guys over 85? Over 85, 86. So it made me realize it doesn't have to be the most spectacular, biggest fish in the world, the most glamorous thing. To get somebody new on the water and show them these experiences and get to go through that with them, that's what it's all about. 86, anybody beat 86? <laughs> hey, we wanna see your driver's license, okay?